Hey everybody, Joseph Rothschild here, aka Mono Blue Tron, back again with another episode of 10 Minute Testing. So today we're trying out a card that was spoiled about a week and a half ago, the Mako Tsunami Nostalgia Cash-In that nobody asked for, the Legendary Fisherman 2. Now this bad boy does, well, actually he doesn't do a whole lot, but hopefully he adds a little bit of some much needed consistency to a personal favorite deck of mine, the Legendary Fisherman 3. So let's jump into deck edit and see what this card has done for such a mediocre strategy. So here's the list. Now you'll notice that there are a bunch of really awful cards in here, so as always I'll do my best to explain a little about the archetype, a little about what I hope the deck can do, and as always the card by card. So first, the Legendary Fisherman is a deck that does not live up to its name. It's based around one of the most famous cards used by Mako Tsunami, everybody's favorite character from the original Yu-Gi-Oh! series. Wait, what's that? Oh, you don't remember Mako Tsunami? Everybody's favorite character from the original Yu-Gi-Oh! series? Oh, and you wish Konami would stop printing unplayable nostalgic cards in a vain effort to win back former players who quit the first time they heard the word Synchro Summon? Well, maybe this will jog your memory. Mako was the one that Yugi attacked the moon against. Uh, anyway, a legendary fisherman is this really bad five-star monster that is almost playable when a legendary ocean is out, but his retrain, a legendary fisherman three, is nuts. You have to tribute a legendary fisherman specifically, but if you do, he can't be destroyed by battle or card effects, and he isn't affected by spells or traps. Additionally, when he is special summoned, he banishes all your opponent's monsters. We're trying to use the Legendary Fisherman 2 to do its best impression of a Legendary Fisherman 1. Now it counts, but unlike Legend 1, it actually has a good effect. He floats in a 3 and isn't affected by monster effects while he's on the field, so hopefully playing 6 resilient copies of Fisherman will make playing 3 just a little bit less clunky. Since the deck is also completely in on a Legendary Ocean, we are playing everything we can in order to get it into our hand, along with some cards that will let us make good use of it in multiples. Since the Legendary Ocean also makes our big meaty men into measly force stars, we also have some toad nonsense going on. So let's get into the list. First, we have number two, the medium-sized man himself. He's only got a crossbow right now, hasn't exactly reached harpoon gun status, but at least he's not using a stick. This card is called a legendary fisherman everywhere but the hand and deck, and he's unaffected by other monsters' effects while Umi is out. When he leaves the field, he gets you a level seven water monster, and since we can't get a pacifist token, we're gonna have to settle for our next card, the legendary fisherman three. This card can't be destroyed by battle or card effects, and he's unaffected by spells or traps. He banishes your opponent's monsters when he comes out, and he can return banished cards to double the damage they take uh, at the beginning of the combat step, I believe the first time. After that is the Legendary Fisherman 1, which we are also playing 3 of. He can't be targeted for attacks and is unaffected by spells. Yawn! After that is 3 Warrior of Atlantis. This guy searches a Legendary Ocean, and we have 3 Koldaris, who can put those extra copies of a Legendary Ocean to use by turning them into removal spells. For spells, we have 3 copies of, well, the Legendary Ocean, thankfully not affected by the Legend rule. This card takes down the levels of our Water Guys by 1, conveniently into range to normal summon our Fishing Men. 3 copies of Terraforming, three copies of Set Rotation, my new favorite card, which will get Umi for us, and Gateway to Chaos for our opponent. Fun fact, since the search on Gateway to Chaos is mandatory, you can't legally activate it without a BLS or a Gaia in your deck, and you actually can't play a field spell over a set field spell, so this card is not only just Terraforming, it also locks our opponent out of their field spell zone for the rest of the game. Next is Feast of the Wild level 5, which can summon up to two of our fishermen without Umi from the graveyard at any time, letting us go into a cool rank 5 play. Two Moria of Greed might be a little greedy, but at the very least it cycles multiples of Warrior. Three Twin Twisters puts these Field Spell Searchers to good use, and Hand Destruction lets us turn them into cards we might actually want to draw. Finally, we've got a Regeki and the Solemn Boys. In the extra, we have a Zen Myo, a Teriel, an Adrius, a Durandal, and a Shark Fortress for fives, some Sharks and some Toads for fours, the Utopia Boys, a Castell, an Abyss Dweller, and the one, the only, Tornado Dragon. With that, let's jump into the games. Our first match is up against True King Dinos, and wow, this deck is going to look good if we only play against opponents who brick. We've opened really well, a Legendary Ocean plus a copy of Legendary Fisherman 2 and 3, the whole crew is here. We're not going to 
go into three turn one because I do want to banish my opponent's entire board. And at the very least, this card floats into three afterwards. We're going to go ahead and set a legendary ocean, normal summon this legendary fisherman two and end our turn. Our opponent is going to draw into Ghost Ash, the sixth card always, summon the Petit Pterodon and end their turn. Uh, we have plays at this point. We're going to go ahead and normal summon legendary fisherman, go into a legendary fisherman three to banish his entire field. Unfortunately, he will send Phantasmal May May Asaurus in order to prevent that from happening. We will then activate Feast of the Wild level five to get the card that is level five in the grave and four on the field, then go into Bahamut Shark, make a Tree Toad, and get attacking. This lets us do 1900 as we attack over and 2500 uh, afterwards. Our opponent is going to draw into a copy of Dark Hole, which unfortunately is a bit of an out to Toad. I will take that. Uh, afterwards, he's going to uh, go ahead and Cosmic Cyclone our Legendary Ocean away, another unfortunate travesty, uh, and then Meniasaurus into a Baby Sarasaurus, which will get him, of course, an Overraptor at end step. I don't know why he has this Geolo in attack mode, because now we're going to be able to use our Legendary Fisherman 3's effect to return these banished cards and double the battle damage he takes from this battle and win. So because our deck just did everything we could have ever wanted, this game it's going to do absolutely nothing we want. We've drawn into the other half of our deck here. This is a brick. And while we do have a way to get a Legendary Ocean, we don't have any way to make use of it since everything in our hand can be normal summoned anyway. Our opponent is playing Deskbot, and they've made some interesting choices in deck building that I think are pretty sexy, actually. They're going to start by making a Gofu, normal summon this Deskbot 3 to go into 2, and then immediately go into Stardust Dragon. I haven't seen that card in a while. Now, fun fact here, uh, Code actually says send, not destroy. So after we moray the extra cards away, we'll make a legendary ocean, use it to send these two to the graveyard, set the other, and set two pieces of negation. He's going to manco my attack, and I'm thinking, oh, shit, can I actually out a 2,000 defense creature? He's going to attack with Despot 4, which is basically target number one for Solemn Strike. That's a cool 1,500 life points off of our total, and I'm thinking I can probably do one more turn without having to desperately pop this Manko with the Legendary Ocean and Koldaris. Uh, he's going to normal summon this Despot 3, and I'm like, okay, that's another card I'll Solemn. Uh, now we're out of Solemns, and we've drawn dead again, so we do have to get the beats on and just pray that, I don't know, we can negate exactly one more thing and make him rage quit. Thankfully, he draws into a Pendulum monster with an effect that discards, so we do get to destroy it and make him rage quit. Now I know what you're thinking. Joseph, you just beat two of the most powerful decks in Yu-Gi-Oh! How will you possibly cap off this profile of an obvious tier zero strategy? Well, don't worry. I'm about to play against the most powerful deck in Yu-Gi-Oh! That's right, true Draco m Monarch. It, it's like all the weakness of Monarch with even less consistency. Um... We've opened okay. Uh, set rotation is actually pretty good against True Draco, but otherwise we may be in a bit of a pickle. Our opponent is going to go first. They're going to uh, immediately tribute for a Majesty Maiden, which is not great. Uh, we'll Twin Twister that card just to get it off the board right now. Don't really want him escalating in any meaningful way. Uh, afterwards, he will get Masterpiece, of course, and we will activate set rotation, hopefully cutting him off from his Draconic Diagram. And after some Mermaid Magic, we find our way into one of our very few cards that attacks over a 23 300 attack creature. Our opponent is going to play Return Tribute for Ignis Heat, and I'm thinking, yeah, my guy floats. Let's walk into Ignis Heat. But what do you know? This set card is Escalation, and immediately, ooh, out comes Masterpiece. So he's going to destroy my set card, knowing that the cards on board are not particularly threatening. He'll attack over, which allows me to get Legendary Fisherman 3. I'm thinking another 2 is potentially an out, because he can't destroy it at instant speed. We draw 1, and maybe he'll forget that he has this ability, but uh, of course he does not. He's going to get in for another 2950 here. Uh, don't don't really know what I can do here. He'll destroy his own copy of uh, Gateway to Chaos in the Field Spell Zone so he can activate Domain. Doesn't really do anything against my deck, but I'm still happy to send it to the graveyard by using this card. Um, this at least blocks for one turn, I guess. It's not <laughs> ideal. Uh, I'm taking another 2950 here, and I really need to draw two or bust, but unfortunately I draw another three, and uh, I guess that's it. So we're back with the deck. I know 2-1 looks tantalizing, but trust me, we... Really had to sack our way out of those games. Uh, this deck is not even remotely good. I've tried several builds, some with more stun elements in the new Tribal Trap, some with Pacifist, some with even more Toads, and none of them came close to competitive against meta. I mean, still, I'm a big advocate for fun, and if nothing else, the strategy is cute. I mean, I'm a firm believer that every human should own at least one deck to play against your friends who like Yu-Gi-Oh, but stopped playing after Summon Skull Beatdown wasn't good anymore, and they'll probably recognize the cards, even. Honestly, if you're just messing around with friends, it's kind of fun to stare down a Drake Cleefort Towers with your own little Towers protege. So, that's that. 
I hope you enjoyed watching me bemoan how uninteractive Masterpiece is while sitting on a monster that is immune to everything. If you want to see me play the decks I make on this show on stream, feel free to follow me at twitch.tv slash monobluetron. I'm on every Monday and Wednesday from 10 to noon Eastern Standard Time. Links in the description. And if you have an idea for a deck or archetype for a future episode of this show, let me know in the comments section below and I will consider it. Otherwise, I will see you Sunday.